My name is Isolde Honoré and I am an Odd Salon Fellow as well as a producer and curator for the San Francisco Odd Salon chapter. Tonight, as we discuss resilience, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Sarah Josephine Baker, a revolutionary figure in public health and preventative medicine, who through common sense and systematic implementation of modern ideas, restructured our approach to treating communicable diseases and innovated the field of child health and hygiene despite considerable obstacles, sexism, pushback, and tons of bureaucratic red tape. When she decided to go into medicine, this idea was met by derision and discouragement. It was considered unwomanly, unfeminine, and no one in her family had ever practiced medicine. It just wasn't done. However, she wanted nothing more than to prove her naysayers wrong. She wrote in her memoir, when I encountered only argument and disapproval, my native stubbornness made me decide to study medicine at all costs and in spite of everyone. And she did practice medicine. She graduated in 1898, set up her first practice, and in the first year only made $185. Treating New York's downtrodden poor is not lucrative. And she ended up having a career as a medical examiner for the New York, New York Department of Public Health. Now, in 1901, this department was poorly managed, inefficient, and corrupt. When she showed up her first day to a dilapidated building, she remarked, it reeked of negligence and stale tobacco smoke and slacking. Many of her fellow inspectors were just there for an easy paycheck, but not Dr. Baker. She rolled up her sleeves and dove into her assigned area of treating sick children in Hell's Kitchen, dubbed by other doctors, the suicide ward. With 6,000 people crammed in per city block, it was thought to be the most densely populated area in the world. Filthy tenements and slums without adequate ventilation or sanitation and living in such quarters spread community diseases easily like dysentery, diphtheria, typhus, typhoid fever, measles, and more. Epidemics swept through the neighborhood with startling regularity. And even worse, not just in this poor neighborhood, but throughout New York City, infants were dying at an alarming rate. In the summer, every week, 15,000 infants died of dehydration and diarrhea. And of one third of all the annual deaths in the city, one third of them were children under five, and most of that amount were infants under the age of one. And even more frustrating was this prevailing medical attitude that babies always died in the summer and there was no point trying to do anything about it. It seemed hopeless, it seemed futile, and Dr. Cho was astonished that anyone could survive in such awful conditions. And any survival was a stunning display of resilience in the face of such poverty. She worked tirelessly to treat as many cases as she could, but even so, the scope and breadth of the problem seemed impossible. Fortunately, a change was coming to the Department of Public Health. In 1902, a new director was hired who quickly fired all the negligent or incompetent staff. Now, Dr. Cho was diligent, principled, and had great ideas and quickly rose to the rank of assistant to the Commissioner of Public Health. She was encouraged to go by Dr. S.J. Baker professionally because, oh, a female in an executive position? That simply isn't done, despite the fact that she was actively doing it. The community, however, affectionately referred to her as Dr. Jo. She adopted a signature masculine style in clothing to be taken more seriously professionally, and in her time in public health, she became sort of a specialist for the most difficult cases, and she, in fact, played a crucial role, role in a famous New York epidemic of typhoid fever, which is easily communicable through contaminated food or water or close proximity to an infected patient. So it made a kind of morbid sense that epidemics of typhoid would sweep through areas like Hell's Kitchen. However, it made less sense that individual cases were popping up in wealthy homes throughout New York. Dr. George Soper had a theory that there was an infected index patient spreading the disease, which led him to suspect Chef Mary Mallon. He thought that she was the first asymptomatic carrier of the disease, a theory which had yet to be proven. So he called the Department of Health to send out a medical examiner to collect blood and urine samples to prove his theory of an asymptomatic typhoid carrier. Enter our heroine, Dr. Josephine Baker, to collect the samples for science and for public health. Dr. Joe tracked Malin to the home where she worked to make the request, but Malin summarily refused. Dr. Joe communicated back to HQ to report that she was unable to obtain the samples and she was told either get them 
or take Malin to the hospital by force if necessary. It was necessary. So Dr. Joe returned with a transport ambulance and two police officers, and this time Malin answered the door, lunging forward, attempting to stab Dr. Baker with a cooking fork. Dr. Baker jumped back, colliding into the policeman behind her, and Mary fled and escaped in the chaos. For two hours, they searched the house top to bottom until they found footprints leading to the neighboring house. Dr. Baker, Dr. Baker grabbed two more policemen and, and again conducted an exhaustive search. And after three hours, they discovered a closet door with ash cans stacked against it with a minute piece of blue gingham caught in the door frame. Sure enough, Mary Mallon was hiding inside and she was strong armed by the police into the ambulance, whereupon to transport the kicking, screaming, cursing, shouting, cussing, fighting Irish woman to the hospital, Dr. Joe literally had to sit on Mary the entire ride to the hospital to restrain her in order to collect the specimens to test the theory of an asymptomatic typhoid carrier for science and for public health. And yes, Ms. Mary Mar Miss. Typhoid Mary was confirmed to be a carrier of the disease, having sickened over 15 people and killing three with her delicious desserts and signature peach melba. She never washed her hands. Please wash your hands. This was not Dr. Baker's only standoff with Typhoid Mary, but I'll post that story to something weird. But back to her heroine. As a now prominent figure in public health, she oversaw school examinations, and traditionally children's children would be examined and sent home if they had a contagious disease. But this neither treated the disease and ended up reducing school populations by about 80%. So Dr. Joe had to come up with a solution to this, and her novel idea was to assign a nurse at each school to help treat the diseases on the spot. And now it's completely the norm throughout the US to have school nurses, and this entire idea was thanks to Dr. Joe. But again, she wrestled with this problem of high infant mortality. She felt that through better education and outreach, most of these problems could be prevented before they started, and she had an epiphany. The way to keep people from dying from disease, it struck me suddenly, was to keep them from falling ill. Healthy people don't die. That sounds like a completely absurd and witless remark, but at the time, it really was a startling idea. So she decided to take this radical idea to her superiors and emerge the first chief of a brand new child health division in New York. But she had to prove herself. She had no staff, she had no budget, but she did have good ideas. And also she had all the school nurses who were out for the summer. So Dr. Joe obtained records of all the newborns in the city and sent out her nurses to instruct the new mothers in a few simple things. First, exclusive breastfeeding, which reduced uh, the incidences of diarrhea, proper ventilation, regular bathing, thin summer clothes to prevent overheating, and fresh air. That was it. And with those five changes, the results were shocking. Infant mortality plummeted from 1,500 cases of infant deaths a week to 300 a week. And the city was delighted and soon the Bureau of Child Hygiene was formed with plenty of funding and Dr. Baker at the helm. As she set out to staff her new agency, she assigned six top doctors to the Bureau and uh, was shocked when that very same day they all tendered their letters of resignation to her. They explained that they respected her professionally, but the idea of a male doctor working for a woman it just wasn't done. So thinking quickly, she had to spin the situation. She told them, see here, you are really crying before you are hurt. I quite realize you may not like the idea of working under me as a woman, but isn't there another side to this question? I do not know whether I am going to like working with you. And then she challenged the stunned and silent doctors to give it a month's trial before they resigned. And at the end of the month, none of them did. In fact, the Bureau continued to grow and flourish and had many good works under, under Dr. Joe. So here's a sampling of just a few of her good works. She treated an epidemic of infant blindness. When children were born and, and caught gonorrhea around the eyes, it caused blindness, which was easily treatable with silver nitrate, but the bottles could be contaminated or the solutions would evaporate to too strong a concentration. So she worked with a lab to develop a foolproof solution of beeswax ampules that contained the correct dosage of silver nitrate droplets. Each tin came with a sterile pin to pierce the ampule. 
And this reduced the cases in New York City from 300 cases of infant blindness a year to just three per year. And it was so effective that these ampules were adopted across the nation and across the world for decades. The next epidemic she treated was the health crisis caused by contaminated milk. She sourced private philanthropic funding to establish 30 safe milk stations in the city. These milk stations also served as a casual sort of education for the poor mothers. Nurses could dole out the milk, then suggest things that mothers could be doing better at home. Dr. Joe leaned hard on the city politicians to support this endeavor and secured even more public funding to establish dozens more milk stations across the city. However, these milk stations proved to be a little too successful. The mayor ended up forwarding Dr. Baker a petition from 30 Brooklyn doctors claiming that the bureau should be abolished because it was ruining medicine and the medical practice because now there were so few unwell children to treat. She laughed, signed their petition, and penned a quick note. This is the first genuine compliment I've received since the bureau was established. I am profoundly grateful for the opportunity to have seen it. And she mailed it back to them. Other things she did, she designed new, easier infant clothing, which were picked up immediately. She started licensing midwives. She also developed efficient record sheets for school examinations that were used for dozens of years after her retirement across the nation. She even took on the cultural challenge of little mothers, who were the girls that had to look after their younger siblings while their own mothers worked. She established the Little Mothers League to teach these little caretakers how to feed, bathe, dress, and play with their little siblings to improve the lot of children throughout the city. Throughout her work in the Bureau, disease and mortality rates had plummeted and this novel idea of public health education had taken root. By 1916, five other states had started their own bureaus of child hygiene modeled after hers. Dr. Joe never backed down from adversity and dug in her heels to navigate through political machinations and affect social change. She even used the press to further the cause of safer infants across the nation. In 1916, in the midst of World War I, she issued a public statement. She wrote, it is six times safer to be a soldier in the trenches of France than to be born a baby in the United States. This sentiment struck deep into the American consciousness and soon the population began to clamor for a change and she had it readily available. She had built an effective model for other states to follow. Dr. Baker had promised herself that if all 48 states adopted a Bureau of Child Health, that she could retire. And by 1923, just seven years later, they all had. She did retire from the Bureau and was personally credited with saving the lives of more than 90,000 infants in New York City alone, not to mention all the changes that she implemented worldwide. And by her retirement, New York had one of the lowest rates of infant mortality in the nation. So I would like to thank Dr. Joe for her resilience in overcoming archaic traditions of it just isn't done or that's just the way it is. So I would like to raise my glass in a toast to the indomitable spirit of Dr. Joe, to the resilient children of New York, and a reminder to please wash your hands often. Thank you.